thanks everyone who's joined us today and anyone who's watching on the recording in the future. Um, so hi, I'm Sophie Thompson. I'm co-founder and CEO of Virtual Speech, which is an online platform that blends e-learning with practice exercises online and in virtual reality. I'm joined by Kashish Kacharia from Rewire Group for today's discussion on DEI in the workplace. So big hello to Kashish. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm um, really excited to speak to you today and to, to learn from you as well. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Really excited. It's a topic that I really care about. So really excited to talk to you guys and um, yeah, see what you have. Please feel free to um, raise your hand and add, ask any questions as we go along the way. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. I'm going to. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, I'm just going to introduce you a bit to a bit of your background. Um, so Kashish has a background in psychology and learning design, having worked as an instructional designer and learning technology technologist in the past. Um, her most recent role was head of learning experience design in the learning lab at PwC UK before last year setting up her own company, Rewire Group. <clears throat> So in that time, um, Rewire Group and Virtual Speech have actually partnered together for our upcoming DNI course, who Kashish is our subject matter expert there and um, content partner. And that's going to be released in February 2023. But don't worry, this is not a promotional webinar. This is purely educational and for your benefit and for my benefit as well, to be honest, um, so that we could all foster more inclusive workplaces for everyone. So without further ado, let's get learning. So I believe Kashish has prepared a short presentation for us um, and then we'll open up the, the room to Q&A. So yeah, if you've got any questions, just hit um, the Q&A at the bottom of the page um, and then we'll get around to them towards the end of the session. Um, or if you wanna save your questions for then, you can just pop yourself off mute or raise your hand and we'll do it that way. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Right, so we're here to talk about inclusion, and as Sophie mentioned, creating a more inclusive workplace and understanding what's currently wrong with um, the training interventions we have and how we can try and make them better. Um, so let's start with a quote that I really like because it explains the difference between diversity, inclusion and belonging in a really nice way. Um, so if you think about it, diversity is having a seat at the table, inclusion is having a voice, and belonging is having that voice be heard. Um, and when I think about this it's, it's and put it into context, it's quite powerful because you may have diversity in numbers, but you may not have inclusion. And you might be inclusive in the sense that you allow different people to talk or you give people you know, equitable airtime and things like that, but people may not feel like they belong because they may feel like their opinions aren't heard. So I think it's a really great quote, um, so just to kick us off. And then um, I'd like to start with asking people to share an experience where they felt excluded. And you know, it can be anything, it can be something quite small or it doesn't need to be related to the workplace, but just the feeling of being excluded. Um, any volunteers? Um, yeah, so if you are in the audience, feel free to raise your hand and contribute there. Um, in the meantime, I'll, I'll contribute in case anybody's feeling shy. Um, I would say when um, I I have some friends who all went to the same school and I didn't go to the same school as them. Um, and that like may sound silly, but I sometimes feel like I'm like, don't quite belong there or like a bit excluded um, just because they have all of these shared memories and experiences that I I don't have those same experiences. Yeah. Anyone else? Anybody want to raise your hand? I can share. Oh, yeah, somebody has <laughs> done brilliant. Things. Thank you for... <laughs> Thank you, Tonka. For being brave. <laughs> I think you might be on mute. Hello. Oh. It's, actually, it's actually not Duncan. It's uh, Duncan's wife. Oh, <laughs> hello, Duncan's wife. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was going to say, um, trying to um, look for a job when you're coming out of a, uh, not the mainstream, looking for a job when you've been working for yourself. 
uh, over 40, you start to feel a bit excluded. And um, I, I certainly felt that for, for a while. So, um, uh, yeah, it, I, I definitely, that's the first time I've ever felt anything like that. So I kind of know that feeling. Yeah, I can definitely empathize with that. Um, anybody else? I don't think we have anyone else, but thank you, um, Duncan's thank you. wife. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I can empathize with that because it was a similar feeling of, um, so I have grown up, born and grown up in India, um, and I moved to the UK when I was 18, did my university there, and after university I was trying to look for a job, um, and the first thing in pretty much any job application is do you have the right to work in the UK, which is understandable, but quite often if you don't pass that you can't apply for the job, and I think that was a point that was a similar feeling of exclusion and, and feeling like it's going to be really difficult uh, to, to, you know, get yourself into the job market. So not exactly the same thing, but I empathize with the feeling of trying to get yourself out there and finding it sometimes exclusionary. Um, thank you very much for sharing. Um, so before we start, I thought it's just helpful to look at some terms that are often used in this space. Um, so there's privilege, um, which is often used, which refers to um, unearned benefits that some people, well, actually every people, every person in some sense or the other has um, based on their social identity or context. Um, similarly, on the flip side, you have disadvantage that refers to sort of barriers and obstacles that you may face based on your social identity or context. And lastly, intersectionality, which provides a lens to look at people's intersecting identity. So for example, I'm a woman, woman of color, when I'm in the UK, I'm an immigrant. So except then the many other parts of my identity that intersect, um, some of which are empowering, some of which are oppressing, um, and they together perpetuate patterns of either disadvantage or privilege. Um, and a person's disadvantage often multiplies if they hold more than one disadvantaged identity. And that's an interesting one because say, for example, you're a woman of color um, and you're an immigrant. So that's, those three identities are going to overlap to form different forms of disadvantage. Um, I also wanted to highlight why I added context there because again, from personal experience, my uh, disadvantage and privilege changes based on context. So for example, when I'm in India, it's different to when I'm in the UK. So it's just one of those, like, I think it's a little bit of a nuance that's quite interesting when you talk to people about and understand how their identity, how they see their identity, uh, how they see their privilege and how they see the disadvantages that they may face. Um, so the next bit is just around choosing inclusion, just starting on a bit of a positive note. So like we just talked about, uh, even if you may not have shared, I hope you kind of try to think about a time where you felt excluded. So we all know what it feels like to be left out, to be excluded from a group or an opportunity, um, the pain of being on the outside, you know, it's it's a, it's a familiar feeling. Um, but if it, instead of exclusion, we can choose inclusion um, by making a conscious effort to include everyone regardless of who they are, um, and trying to create a sense of belonging and acceptance, which is why we're trying, which is what we're trying to talk about here. How do we do that? Um, so, what, what are we going to talk about? Um, we're going to talk about why DEI training often misses the target. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the problem, um, and then we're going to look at ways to impact more lasting change. And then I wanted to end with something a bit more tangible, so I decided to share three things you can do tomorrow uh, to create a really, really simple things to maybe create a more inclusive workspace Great. starting tomorrow. Um, so, oops, I'm going to have to shift this. Um, so we all know this sort of saying, if you have a brain, you have a bias. Um, to be human is to have bias, but so much training just ends there. It kind of tells you, you have biases, the types of biases you might have, but really we need to reframe how we talk about bias, whether implicit or explicit, and have a more comprehensive and action-oriented understanding if you want to drive real change. Um, and 
just to reiterate what we were talking about before, if you don't intentionally include, it's very easy to unintentionally exclude. Quite often intentions aren't to exclude, but it's quite easy to just exclude someone by default. Um, That's a really good point, actually. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it like that before. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. I think when we're busy and life is, life is quite often very busy, it's that's generally when we also tend to unintentionally exclude because we don't take a moment to think about mm. sort of, you know, the intentional. Yeah. 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 Um, so why DEI training often fails? Um, many interventions are simply too brief. Um, they're often part of induction or tucked away with standard training and just last about 30 minutes to an hour and it ends there. Um, given that it's not very surprising that there's not a very lasting impact of that intervention. Um, a recent report by Britain's Equality and Human Rights Commission examined 18 papers on unconscious bias training programs and found that courses are effective at raising awareness of bias, but limited evidence of long lasting behavioral change as what you would expect um, in some, you know, you can't, you can't really change something so fundamental in 30 minutes to an hour. Mm -hmm. um, now, why should we talk about this at all and why should we care? Um, it's just like a few quick stats. 76% um, of job seekers report a diverse workforce is an important factor when evaluating companies and job offers. So it's important to job seekers. Um, only 47% of managers feel prepared to talk about race with employees. I mean, we all know it's a bit of a sensitive and awkward subject. <laughs> That's a pretty high number mm -hmm. given, uh, yeah. Uh, and then more than six billion in, is spent on DEI initiatives every year. Seventy percent of corporate diversity programs struggle to achieve measurable results. Six million is also a pretty big number. Mm. Um, so, what can we do about all of this? Uh, but before we get to that, let's think a little bit more. Let's talk a little bit more about the problem. So, like we're just like we're just talking about training is unlikely to be a standalone solution but it can be a really effective component of a multi-layered approach to improving diversity equity and inclusion um we need to think a bit more critically about the level of commitment necessary to bring about real change um and to measure the outcomes i think the measuring outcomes bit is often not done very well or not done at all um and this is where a lot of things sort of you know, it, you have your new shiny program, but you may not have, firstly, make it part of a more effective strategy. And secondly, really look at how things are um, panning out and whether you need to adapt that strategy. Um, next, turning expected behaviors into easy to defend do's and don'ts as part of a training intervention is problematic. You see this quite often, and this approach contradicts basically everything we know about motivating people to change their behavior. Um, the more you try to reduce the problem and the more you make it a control tactic sort of way of, of managing diversity and you're creating a lot more of PC culture instead of people who are actually buying into this as a problem and trying to work towards helping shift their behavior and helping create a more inclusive culture. Um, research also shows that diversity training is more effective if spread over a longer period. So, you know, you might have a course, but then you might also have comms that go along with it over uh, then different exercises that go along with it over an extended period of time. So that's not a one and done sort of situation. Um, we need a longer journey. And then of course, alongside that structural changes to policies and operations like this, and, and these are quite common things, but may not have be implemented in loads of companies like the standardization of hiring processes, the elimination of self-assessments from performance reviews as, for example, women or minorities often underrate themselves and that already biases the person before they even start writing a performance review and the right incentives for improving diversity, inclusion and belonging. We need to commit to working towards change in both the macro and micro culture of an organization. So again, this is an interesting point because you an individual can't necessarily change the macro culture by themselves. However, the impact you have as an individual in your team and with the people you spend every day with is massive. And if you know if you work in a big organization, it's even easier to see because there is like a bigger culture. But the team you belong to really impacts 
how your day-to-day -day looks like and how much you like working in the company, et cetera. So really as individuals, the microculture of inclusion and allowing people to feel like they belong is something we can all really affect quite easily. Um, and then it's hard to improve something you're not even tracking. Um, so again, in a recent survey, 87% of respondents indicated that their firm's training doesn't go much past explaining the science behind bias and the costs of discrimination. And only 10% of training programs actually include strategies for reducing bias. So the idea that we can reduce our bias simply by being aware of it is, is flawed to start with. It's like saying, um, I'll tell you about how many calories are included in your in different food, and I'll tell you the benefits of exercise. But that's it. Now, you know, it, it's not going to help you really effectively lose weight. Um, so what can we do um, now that we talked about some of the problems? Um, to create more lasting change, there, here are three ways that you could enable that. So you have social accountability, engagement, and empathy. And we're basically going to start looking at each of them individually. But I'm going to pause and see if there are any questions. Um, we have had um, one question, but I don't know if maybe you'll be covering this. But um, you talked about um, measuring success. And so the question is, how can we measure the outcomes of, um, of our DE and I training? That's a really good question. Um, it doesn't, I don't go into that in a lot of detail in this presentation, but it depends on the type of program that you're designing. Um, I think ways to do it is almost like experiments after the training is done. So for example, a really, uh, a really well received training was um, measured after, so after three months, they kind of asked people to, um, Sorry, let me go back. The training was about uh, the training was about raising awareness of gender bias in the workplace, um, and that was kind of the focus of the training. They, three months later, they then asked um, individuals and teams where people um, had taken uh, this course uh, whether they would like to um, sort of give an open appreciation and uh, feedback to some people, and essentially like a, sort of shout them out in public. And then they measured that against the control group and saw how many people actually picked, because it was a brilliant opportunity to pick women who were overlooked after taking the training. Mm -hmm. um, so it's yeah. things like that, like trying to design social experiments around what your training was focusing on and seeing whether there is an actual impact against the control. Um, and that's how you can see whether there was an actual change uh, of behavior or whether, because asking people right after the training, do you feel more aware of bias? You're probably gonna have loads of people say, yes, I do feel more aware, yeah. yes, I do feel more confident um, in having these conversations, but really seeing whether it's happened is a different yeah. situation. It's not so the try... same thing as actually changing behavior. No, so usually my way of doing it is trying to understand the purpose of training and your culture and who the training is for, and then understanding where you can sort of add these little bits to get more information over a period of time, maybe two weeks, six weeks, three months, 12 months, and see how much of a lasting impact you've made and then and then tweak what, what you're doing, basically. Mm. I hope that made sense. Yeah, I think that's a really good point as well to not just find out straight after the training's happened, but even, as you say, even two weeks, which isn't very long after the training, like if, if people's behaviors have, or perception of themselves has reverted back, then, um that's not good <laughs> let alone um then if six months later 12 months later so I think that's a really good point to measure the impact over time don't just measure it once and then assume that's true for the next year yeah and try to get data from multiple sources because self often a lot of training evaluation is done through sort of either people evaluating themselves or evaluating how they think their attitudes or confidence or skill you know how much they've changed or it's looking at their line managers but really you want to look at people in their team what they have do they see changes you want to look at qualitative and quantitative data so trying to have a more varied strategy um is helpful to get your realistic picture great thank you um we do actually have a couple of other questions but i might save them 
So after right. the next section, because one of them is about engagement. So I think it probably fits in better after this yeah. section. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the first one we'll be looking at is accountability. Um, so when we're talking about ac accountability here, we're also talking about social accountability, uh, which is basically each one of us thinks about how we look in the eyes of others and we want to seem good and fair and it that drives our behavior. So this is about social accountability. Um, in a field study conducted by MIT's um, Sloan School of Management, a firm found it consistently gave African-Americans smaller raises than white staff, even when they had identical job titles and performance ratings. So this is your problem. How can you then use something like social accountability to help fix it? So they decided to use transparency to activate social accountability. So each unit had to um, basically publish their average performance rating and pay raise by race and gender. And once managers realized that people are watching, um, their employees, their peers, their superiors, and um, everyone else in the company will be looking at what they've posted, the, jet, the gap basically disappeared because there was the feeling of needing to defend your mm -hmm. choice. And also some, the media, like for big companies. Wow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think they're, the I world mean, could know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I mean, there, there is that as well. So it, it's, I think it almost makes you self-edit when you have to be transparent like that. It makes you question your choice to ensure it's more objective. So you can actually, with full confidence, defend and say, this is exactly why I did this. And that's a pretty good way to help people um, limit some of their biases. Um, Then another good one is we often lack, each of us lack a clear sense of our bias and how it affects us because it's it's ours and we've lived with it probably for a really, really long time. Um, so seeking feedback from others or having a mentor uh, who can help you reflect on how you spend your time at work, with whom you spend all your time, when you're handing out assignments and to whom, et cetera, can really be helpful to understand your default choices and help keep you accountable. So for example, you may not realize that you're always inter interrupting, say, a younger person in your team or the women in your team because it's not something that you're thinking about consciously, but others will know. And if you seek that feedback, then hopefully you can act on it and change your behavior. Um, so almost seeking external feedback for your actions to try and learn more about how you interact with others is a really helpful way. Um, next, so another uh, example or another uh, thing that you can do is uh, set up nudges. So this is not, like I know we were talking about um, sort of how do you make how do you ensure uh, that your training has been successful. So something like nudges can also be a way to gain data as well. So for example, before managers write perform performance reviews, they might be re reminded to avoid giving feedback about employees' personalities, um, and then you can almost do an A/B testing thing where you know, where the nudge was present or where the nudge wasn't present, what was the difference? Was the nudge impactful? Um, but this can be part of your longer term strategy. So you've had your training session and you've had your different policies, et cetera, but you also have these nudges as reminders to help people at the moment of need um, sort of influence their behavior. So for example, another one is recruiters might be asked to reflect on key job requirements before discussing candidates. So again, you're reminding them about the objectivity and the job requirements before they're actually having the discussion about who the right candidate for the job is. Um, so hopefully this will answer your questions about engagement, but if not, uh, we'll get we'll get to the question. Um, so three decades worth of data from more than 800 US firms and interviews with hundreds of line managers show that organizations get better results when they ease up on control tactics. Um, so it's more effective to engage managers in solving the problem, increasing their on-the-job contact with diverse people and promoting social accountability, which is, you know, so people feel like they're looking fair-minded. Um, instead of creating a PC culture where people are really scared of um, opening up or talking at all um, and shutting the whole conversation down. So when someone's belief and behavior are out of sync, they experience cognitive dissonance. And as 
we all have a very deep need to reduce that dissonance, dissonance as much as we can. Um, so for example, when managers actively help boost diversity, they begin to think of themselves as diversity champions. Um, and then that that's something that becomes really important to them. And that's how hopefully, hopefully you say, see real behavior change. Um, similar thing happens when you're looking at mentoring. So in sponsoring individuals for key opportunities, um, mentors are help, helping giving mentees breaks to help them develop in advance. Um, and then the mentors come to believe that their prodigies sort of merit these opportunities irrespective of identity factors, because anyone I sponsor must be deserving. That's kind of cognitive dissonance at work again. So on average, mentoring programs actually have a really good success rate uh, comparatively. So the boost of representation of Black, Hispanic, and Asian American women and Hispanic and Asian American men by 9% to 24%. Um, Interventions like targeted college recruitment, mentoring programs, self-managed teams, and task forces often boost diversity more successfully than a more control um, sort of top-down approach, because this is allowing people to actually get engaged in, in the um, and be part of the journey, basically, instead of excluding groups from it. Um, and it makes them feel like they have a greater sense of ownership of their change as well, doesn't it? Exactly. Um, research also shows, so the next bit is empathy, um, the number three, where research shows that if we have less empathy for someone uh, who is different from us, we're less likely to um, sort of, we're more likely to treat them worse. Um, so connecting with others through empathy can really improve um, how we interact through our differences. Um, we might not know exactly what it's like to be someone of a different race, gender identity, religion, or sexual orientation, but everyone, like we saw, to some extent, knows what it feels like to be excluded, and that's almost a commonality. Um, so instances where leaders and employees subtly exclude others or downplay their contributions are one of the most common forms of biases at play, and learning interventions that focus on these are really, really impactful. Um, Quite often you may find more exaggerated sort of representations in learning interventions, but they're not necessarily reflecting reality and they may miss the nuances that are at play in the actual workplace because it's often quite subtle. Um, I mean, I know I've had instances where I wasn't even sure if you know something was caused because of bias or not because it's that subtle and it takes time to see patterns. Um, we don't put ourselves in someone else. We, yeah, it, we don't easily put ourselves in someone else's shoes naturally. Um, but if we do, it really helps us create more positive relationships and be more concerned about other people's welfare. Um, so even something as simple as instructing participants to take another person's point of view reduces bias against stigmatized groups. Um, so it's just around empathy and perspective taking just that as a first step in itself is quite impactful um, in trying to get people on the journey to help reduce their biases. So some of the ways you can also do this is creating opportunities for people to learn about others' views and experiences and expand their inner circles. Um, training sessions in themselves can be an often great way to do this, um, to try and work with colleagues who are unlike yourself or not in your team or you don't interact on a daily basis. Um, and obviously the success of something like this is tied to how diverse your uh, workplace is in the first place, um, but it's really helpful to try and get people to interact with people they wouldn't normally. Um, the, the reality is, I really like this quote because I think it's very, um, it rings really true. The reality is your go-to people become a self-fulfilling prophecy. These people have more access to your time and are aware of opportunities before others. Leaders need to expand their networks to reach untapped potential. Um, so if you're always, if you're in a pinch, you're going to go to your go-to person because they're reliable and they're what you know, and that's safe. Um, but that also keeps perpetuating the same uh, kind of biases in the workplace. So trying to be aware of that and asking yourself, or asking more of yourself in terms of opening your circles up and networking with others is a really helpful thing. Um, and then lastly, like we, we talked about microculture before, but how do you really 
um, try and impact that. So I think one of the best ways is just simply trying to be more aware and mindful of your own actions and those around you. Um, and so it might be good to have like a little list of questions. Obviously, that's not an exhaustive list, um, but it's maybe like a list that can inspire other questions. So, for example, in your meetings, who speaks the most and who speaks the least? Um, who gets interrupted the most? Maybe you can pick one question each meeting and just kind of try and concentrate <clears throat> and analyze. Um, Sorry. No, Sorry, I thought it was on mute then. Apologies, everyone. <laughs> um, how does this change in important meetings? That's often an interesting one because it might be different based on how important that meeting is viewed by the team. Um, who arranges most of the socials or often picks up the slack? Um, or often makes coffee or cleans up. Um, who does the boss go to with any technical questions? Um, and are there opportunities you're missing to be an ally? Um, sort of just asking yourself those might be good starter ways to help you be more empathetic. Um, and then, of course, noticing any trends because that's hard to do if you're just looking at things as one offs. Um, okay, so I will pause there and see any questions that have come through. Um, yeah, great. That was all so interesting. I've like been writing notes. I hope you can, <laughs> can hear me typing away there. <laughs> um, so yes, we do have a couple of questions. So Duncan has asked, this is related to engagement as well. How do you recommend getting staff engaged and involved and really getting behind DEI efforts? So I think, yeah, that's talking about like, yeah, so go on. Maybe you can tell me a bit more around what barriers you're facing. Um, okay. I might type back to Duncan. Can we unmute? Is it Duncan's wife? Can we unmute? Duncan? Oh, yeah. Duncan's wife. <laughs> Where is she? Participants. Is she there? We might have to come. Uh, yeah, no, it's just yes. to sort of get the team more. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, got you. Uh, yeah, no, it's just to get the team um, engaged in in these activities, um, ways to encourage them to really get involved with the, the strategies that we're in implementing. Yeah, like, do you mean in terms of, like, motivation? Because I know oh, in yeah. the past when I've been at companies and, like, they're holding D and i events and the people you want to be going to those events aren't the ones who actually opt in to go to them. So, um, yeah, I, I think, like yeah, exactly, exactly. yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting one because a lot of research shows lot, making things compulsory actually puts people off, especially the ones who are sort of maybe not bought into the idea in the first place. Um, but at the same time, as you say, there's a problem. If someone is not necessarily um, interested in the topic, they may not join at all. Um, I think an approach that's often been quite helpful is trying to tone down sort of be, being really mindful of how you're wording your communications. Um, so I think the preachy tone, for example, or even certain phrases almost shuts people off before they even start going to the training. I, th I think focusing on commonality and inclusion versus exclusion, that kind of narrative helps bring more people in, even people who may not necessarily be bought into DE and I as a whole, but trying to get them to empathize from an I think empathize from an inclusion versus exclusion thing is quite helpful um, and then as we I didn't go into a lot of detail in this presentation but it really helps to have different kind of interventions for the different personas if you like um, so for example you have you have people like you said who are already bought into it and they will need different kind of interventions to people who say are almost so there are people in the middle who will be sort of borderline they may or may not know that this is something that they care about and then there are people who definitely don't care about it and having different interventions targeted at each of these persona groups can be quite helpful that's a really good point thank you Kashish did that answer your question yeah no great that's really interesting you put it really well thank you all right 
Great, thank you. Um, so then our other question is from Susie. Um, she says, you mentioned VR. I'd be interested to know how VR can be used for diversity training. Do you want to take this, Sophia? Do you want me to take it? <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> this is a good opportunity. We could talk about our course, but I think I'll talk, we'll talk more generally and then we'll talk more specifically about um the learning design behind what we've done together. Um, <clears throat> so um, this actually ties in really nicely with what Kashish has just been talking about in terms of empathy. And um, VR can enable people to feel a greater sense of empathy because of their active participation in the learning. So for example, um, with a d &I module, you might be put in the shoes of someone else's experience <clears throat> now obviously a 10 minute vr module is not going to be representative of someone's lived experience of 30 40 50 years but it gives people like an insight and a reflection point and a conversation point to to open up those conversations and to reflect on themselves of when how they possibly been showing patterns of this unconscious bias and not just becoming aware of it but becoming more of an, an ally to it as well and I think the the power of VR is the emotional connection that you get with the learning material um, I think sometimes with with other learning methods you you either don't remember them for a long period of time or if you are just reading them it's very passive um, whereas with VR, you're actively involved in the experience and you learn through experience, which naturally, even on like a neurological <laughs> level, um, stays with you a lot more because it feels like um, it happened to you almost. Um, so, I mean, that's that's what I'd say there. Kashish, what would you add there? Yeah, I mean, like you said, like cognitively speaking, um, VR is amazing for something like this, especially around empathy and perspective taking, because it essentially activates your mirror neur neurons so you're almost feeling what this other person is feeling and like I just I covered this a little bit uh, in a cu couple of slides ago is it's really hard for us to naturally put ourselves in someone else's shoes if if this is not your reality you're not necessarily going to even think about forget understand what little microaggressions feel like etc so having some and having more subtle examples of that through a VR is a very impactful way of getting someone to increase their empathy perspective taking and understanding of parts of the lived experience that can be quite frustrating um day to day um so yeah and I, I mean there are lots of stats around this as well around why around how much more impactful vr is with something like this um hmm. i think topics like um d and i training are particularly interesting for VR because there's so many layers to it. There's so many layers to where we form our bias or unconscious bias and um, our perspectives. Like it's sometimes it is deeply ingrained in people. And there's so many layers to it. There's so much neuroscience behind it. Um, and so VR can tap into that like extra level of understanding. And as Kashish said, of feeling as well. Um, so, so, for example, what we've done together, um, Kashish has designed a brilliant VR experience that shows um, in a working day in the life of um, a, the main character is called Anushka. Um, Kashish, do you want to tell people a bit more about where that experience takes them just briefly and then we'll, we'll yeah. be promotional? <laughs> um, so it came from, it was... I, we felt it was quite important for it to reflect sort of real lived experiences. So we, we collected um, stories from different people around what sorts of microaggressions, discriminations they feel they find in the workplace, um, how often they feel excluded, what those instances look like alongside things like when they've actually felt someone's effectively been an ally, etc. So we gathered all of that. We tried to then create a really subtle but impactful hopefully um experience uh that kind of takes you in the uh through the day of a woman who is um an immigrant and works in in a very in a senior role in a senior technical role and what her day looks like so they're really subtle things like someone forgetting to introduce you or um you know thinking that you're not the expert or 
some of those tiny things that are all too familiar uh, or some part like there's a narrative that shows some of the self-editing that you tend to do especially if you belong to um some of these uh some of the minority groups because you constantly feel like you need to be very conscious uh, at least I know I do very conscious of how you're portraying yourself etc um so that was kind of thinking behind it um it's not there is no theory in it it's more just experience over um over anything in order to help empathy uh, enhance that feeling of perspective taking and understanding of what that feels like um great thank you Susie has come back to us and said sounds amazing thanks so thank you Kashish um yeah I think we can carry on with our practical steps now yeah so this is basically us reaching the end and I as I said, I thought it'd be great to have like three really simple things you can do. Um, so the first one is observe and recognize microaggressions and exclusions in the first meeting of the day, um, probably tomorrow for, for a group of us. Um, then uh, practice perspective taking and empathy by in interacting with someone you wouldn't usually talk to and ask them about their lived experience. I find I found this really awkward at first, but I found it really helpful. Um, so I actually did this, I, I do this every week, like try and find someone that, you know, whether they're a lot older than people I usually tend to talk to, a lot younger, um, maybe they're in a different team, uh, or maybe they're just like not someone I work with regularly, so we don't talk a lot. Um, but just kind of like taking a moment to be like, it's lunchtime, how, how about let, let's get a coffee or a virtual coffee and just talk about what their reality looks like and try and understand. Um, and then lastly, appreciate someone who often gets overlooked. I mean, every team has someone like that who doesn't necessarily get a lot of praise or overt um, positive feedback. So take a moment to sort of appreciate them for something they did really well this week. Um, and hopefully these three things together will create a slightly more inclusive environment for your team members. Sorry, I lost the mute button there. <laughs> and I was going to say, if you, even if we all just did those like, three things, like you could already just feel like what a nicer working environment we would all be in. That people who are often overlooked and may feel unappreciated. Like imagine if there was nobody who felt like that. That would be amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much, Kashish. Um, I think... We've all learned a lot there. I know I have. Um, I think one of the key things that I take away is something that you said quite early on, actually, is that as an individual, you can make an impact when you have intention in your in your actions and the way that, that you treat people. And, and as you said, like intentionally look out for things and make it your mission to, to be inclusive by making sure people aren't excluded and actively making them feel included um and then even if that just starts with you it can have a positive multiplier effect over time um so i think that certainly fills me with some optimism there as well um before we ask if there's any final questions i, I just wanted to ask you kashish if people only take away one thing today although I don't know how that's possible but <laughs> if they were only to take away one thing what would you like that to be try to connect with as many different types of people you can and encourage that in your um, teammates so for example my husband is mixed race and we often talk about this kind of like this topic a lot because we're both passionate about it and he was telling me how in most forms there's no uh, box for mixed race it's always other and how exclusionary that feels um wow. this is not something I would have ever thought about uh because it's not my reality I always have my box um but something as small as that is quite eye-opening and I would never know that if you didn't have that conversation mm. so I think they're always whoever you are whatever your identities are they're always things that other people may not have thought of because it's not their reality but just being mm. able to talk about that is really impactful because it it's one it, it gets you one step closer to understanding each other. Um, so I think that would be my sort of key takeaway, though it's a hard one. Yeah, 
Wow, that's really interesting. And even, I mean, you probably saw from my reaction when you told me I had, I had <laughs> no idea about that either. So yeah, like it really just showed the importance of having those conversations and filling your life with different people, not necessarily the same people you've known for the last 20 years or people from the same demographic, whatever that might look like. Um, so are there any final questions in our last couple of minutes? Anyone want to raise a hand? Um, if not, that's fine. We have already done some of the questions, so that's good. Um, Kashish, is there anything else that you wanted to add before I uh, round us out? No, thank you all for listening to me for an hour. I really appreciate it. <laughs> oh, no, it's been it's been brilliant. Thank you. Um, actually, just quickly, if people want to get in contact with you, um, what's the best way to do that? Is it what's on the screen? <laughs> yes um please get in touch with those any of those details and you'll find me you can also add me on linkedin um for any further conversations brilliant thank you very much um so yes thank you everybody who joined us today and thank you so much to kashish um of course if you'd like to learn more from kashish about this topic in particular and learn with us in BR. Um, you can register your interest for our new course together at virtualspeech.com. Um, but otherwise, that is the end of today's session. And um, I wish you all a lovely rest of your day. Thank you.